Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Prisma Access Business Continuity and Enabling a Secure Mobile Workforce. My name is Meredith Bankenstein. I am on the federal marketing team here at Palo Alto Networks. And along with me today, I have David Nisley, who is the Director of Federal Program Capture, Capture I'm sorry, and Brian Wenger, who is a federal systems engineer. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A pod and we'll address them either during the presentation or live at the end. I, am, I hope that we'll have time to get to all questions, but if we don't, we'll be sure to follow up with you at the end. I'd like to kick it over now to you, David. Thanks, Meredith. So, uh, appreciate you joining us here uh, this, this morning. We've, uh, at Palo Alto Networks, have been working to put together offerings to help solve the unique challenges that we're all facing right now. Um, as of this morning, uh, if you didn't see, there's a third uh, stimulus bill, which is providing funds into our federal government customer base, state and local entities, uh, across government as a whole to provide funds uh, in helping to, to you know, uh, respond to this crisis. And as part of that, it's pretty interesting. There's multiple places in there where they are devoting funding to um, tackling this mobile user uh, issue that everyone is facing. So today we're gonna kind of walk through a couple things that we've done. Uh, Palo Alto Networks has an, an offering to enable mobile workers. Uh, that is unique and a little, you know, a different approach than some of uh, the other competitors doing that sort of thing in the market today. Um, and the, the main point that we have, our differentiator, is that we offer a cloud-native platform. So uh, that, that is the key to this discussion. Um, you know, if you look at the traditional infrastructure that, that you know, a federal government agency is, is facing today uh, and, and is running today, they have a VPN client, you know, something that's doing that on an on-prem basis. Um, everybody is looking at the future technologies that would replace that kind of infrastructure, but in, by and large, most folks have, have that on-prem infrastructure. Um, and that's designed for 10, 20% of those people to be, you know, working remote at any given time. Now that we've kind of flipped the script and you have 90 plus percent of their population working remote, it has obviously caused some, some major challenges. And with the shipping uh, crisis the way it is with everything that's going on, they can't even ship out hardware even if they did want to buy it. Um, so we've put together uh, something that makes it easy for our customers to consume the technology that could be a really good um, gap fill for them. So you could go to the next slide, Mary. So you can see the tiers here. What we've done, I mean, there's several products that make up an offering, and uh, Brian is going to walk through what that what that looks like and how it works. But just like any software company, um, you know, there's rarely a single quote unquote SKU that represents a total solution. So Prisma Access is part of our Prisma pillar. Uh, Prisma is something that Palo Alto Networks has renamed into our cloud security offerings. We've acquired uh, a dozen plus companies over the last year and a half. And the vast majority of those are various cloud security capabilities. And we've integrated them into a single platform in this Prisma offering. Uh, the one we're talking about today, uh, Prisma Access, is the primary kind of foundational offering that, that, uh, that makes up this remote user use case. But as a part of that, you need um, Cortex is, is another kind of pillar of technology from us. And so you need the logging capability from that. You need a management console in the way of something called Panorama from us. Um, there's a couple different tools that come together to make this offering up. So rather than confuse our customers and our partners with, uh, hey, we've got you know, six different SKUs that you need to figure out uh, how many of each of them, that's why we've put together these bundled tiers. So if you have 9,000 users within a customer base, you can very simply see that to get this offer, uh, to get this capability off the ground, 9,000 times by $34, that's what you can budget for. Uh, that is a number um, that our customers can very accurately go back and, and confidently predict that that's the most this is going to cost. Uh, that is a customer facing number. We still, just like almost every software company in the world, uh, don't traditionally sell direct. So the purchase order from customers would still uh, go through our standard channel process. We have a, a network of authorized reseller partners, both large and small businesses. Um, these could be fulfilled through our systems integrator community. So 
um, uh, service providers, you know, like carriers, AT&T, CenturyLink, um, Verizon, et cetera. This, this is a flexible offer that can be consumed by, by any of our partners on behalf of a government agency. And we will work with our internal partners to, to, uh, to structure the actual uh, SKUs that make it up on the back end, but that's, this is something that can be transacted today on a government purchase order. These SKUs are live on Soup today. Uh, they're in the process of being added to GSA, and we can pretty much get them on any contract vehicle a customer would want. Um, so this gives you the capability to accurately predict what it's going to cost and uh, the capability to deploy it. So backing up for one second, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies out there offering free licenses or extended evaluation periods for customers. And that may make perfect sense if you run a small business. But our federal customers, um, you know, if, if you got a free evaluation license, often it's not the exact same license as a, a full-on enterprise edition license, number one. Um, and we want our customers to have all the capabilities they really need, not, not a light version. Um, and two, they're going to have to budget what they do at the end of that period. So some of our competitors and some folks out there are offering 14-day periods, 30-day periods, 90-day periods. Uh, what happens at the end of that period? So they have to figure out if they want to buy it. They're still going to have to do something procurement-wise. Um, and we haven't seen the challenge as much within our federal customer base be the procurement or the funding. They have the funding, as we talked about at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, the emergency funds are out there and flowing, thank God, uh, for, for these customers. It's, and, and the procurement officers have been directed and are working as valued partners and are you know, cutting through the red tape. They have a very valid reason to speed up procurement for mission critical things, and this is a mission critical offering. Um, so as a part of this, you get all the standard subscriptions that make this up. This is all an entirely software offer from us. Um, it, uh, it gives you a, um, uh, call it a, a fast track services offering that helps you deploy it. It's a standard uh, services offering from us, uh, kind of like a warranty or a support option that you would buy as a part of any other software. And then we're also offering 10 hours of sales engineering support in addition to that. Um, and we'll work with you. If it takes more than 10 hours, we'd certainly, you know, work whatever that, that makes sense to get the, the project off the ground. Uh, and this is something we've been deploying in, in the neighborhood of 24 to 48 hours should the conditions be, um, you know, what we need. And uh, so we can work with you further to kind of figure out the deployment plan and look forward to doing that. Um, but this is what, and this is a year uh, subscription to everything that we're talking about. So this would give our federal customers a very easy way to consume something that is an enterprise scalable uh, offering that would support anywhere from a pocket of three, 500 users, you know, in some component of a government agency, all the way up to certain government agencies are in the midst of procuring this for 500,000 users. It's the same platform, and because it's cloud native, it scales to both of those environments uh, and costs the same to the customer. So we uh, look forward to any questions you have on these uh, bundles, and I'll turn it over to Brian here uh, to walk through the technical aspects. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. So I want to take a a brief minute to kind of walk through the technical overview of what the trust bundles components are and what some of the major values that you're going to see as you start to implement a solution like Prisma Access. Uh, but before I do that, I think it's really important to start to define some of the issues that a lot of organizations are seeing with this uh, remote work capabilities being scaled up. So because of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of agencies and a lot of organizations have started to see a lot of growth in their remote work capabilities and remote work requests. Um, the growth and the need and the desire to have these workers working remotely has created some, some scalability issues inside of these legacy uh, VPN solutions. So if you look at a legacy VPN solution, you typically have the VPN concentrator or the hardware that's hosted on-prem, and you have all the mobile users that are connecting into that on-prem location. This model was an extremely efficient model when it was originally kind of designed and pushed out, and this was mostly related to the fact that you had a lot of branch and enterprise traffic that was the majority of your, your egress traffic, and you had a very small amount of users that were actually using remote work capabilities. 
So as organizations started to put these solutions together, um, they're seeing some issues now with the way that these solutions were actually architected. Uh, some different organizations, they just never plan to see the scale and the amount of remote workers that they're seeing now with this pandemic, with physical locations being shut down. Uh, and organizations who did properly plan to have all of their workers have these remote work capabilities, they're running into a number of other issues that isn't just based on hardware scalability. So the way that some of these agencies are starting to tackle this solution when they start to realize that they have two, three, 10, 100 times more remote workers than they used to is they're tackling it the way that most engineers would tackle a problem. They are trying to scale out their hardware capabilities. So they're bringing more physical form factor devices on, they're bringing more virtual form factor devices on um, to try to handle the increase of bandwidth that we're, th we're seeing. And what you start to realize as you scale out that, that architecture is scaling out only solves a portion of the problem. It doesn't solve the entire issue. Because while you might have more capacity in the hardware, you're still going to be bottlenecking and limited based on the bandwidth that you have at your internet gateways. And part of this issue, right, is that you have all these mobile users that are connecting back into these physical data centers and all of the traffic that they're, they're sending, regardless of it should be destined to on-prem or if it should be destined to the internet, it's all getting hairpinned back into the data center. And what that does is it essentially adds exponential growth on the traffic that's going into the data center because it's all ingressing over your internet pipes when only a portion of it's actually required to be ingressing over your internet circuits. So what's the business problem here? Well, the business problem is that as agencies are attempting to scale out, they're putting more investments into the hardware capabilities to, to try and scale out, which might not necessarily address the root cause of the issues they're seeing. Uh, they're spending more operational budgets just to troubleshoot basic issues because of the scalability issues. But most importantly, they're seeing uh, applications not function the way that they should because of these bottlenecks at the internet gateways. And because the applications aren't functioning the way that they should for these remote users, you're seeing decreased performance and decreased efficiency out of these remote users. So what Palo Alto has done with their Prisma Access solution is they're attempting to solve this bottleneck issue with the internet gateway capacities. And they're solving that by hosting a remote access solution completely in the cloud. So while you still have your traditional mobile users and we see this growth of mobile users connecting to the network because of the work from home requirements, they're no longer bottlenecking themselves into a traditional data center. Each one of the mobile users is going to be connecting dynamically to gateways which are hosted in the cloud. And as that traffic is funneling into the cloud, um, we're leveraging the back the fiber backbone of the cloud itself to route the traffic. So the traffic is getting routed from these gateways directly to the web. It's getting routed directly to different SaaS applications or the public cloud. And only the traffic that's required to get into the data center is actually being routed into the data center. That actually is helping reduce the, the overhead on the internet circuits because you're peeling off all the traffic that doesn't need to be destined to the data center, you're peeling it off before it ever gets there. And the fact that the solution is hosted in the cloud, it gives us dynamic scalability. So as you start to see even more mobile users onboarded past a, uh, a POC, the cloud capabilities have the ability to scale out to meet that growing demand of users. Um, and it also has the ability to provide all the security services that you would have typically applied on your traditional VPN concentrators. All that's going to be applied at the ingress on the gateways which are hosted inside of the cloud. Um, the way that Prisma Access functions is we have eight of these gateways that are hosted in the CONUS regions. Um, 
which is all viable solutions for federal customers. And outside of just the CONUS regions, uh, there's well over 100 different locations that are providing service. So these mobile users have access to gateways, which are geographically close to the locations which they're doing their work out of. So what is Prisma Access? Prisma Access is a SASE based solution. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, a SASE based solution is a secure access service edge. But what is a secure access service edge? So a secure access service edge is a cloud hosted technology that actually provides the ability to provide transport for remote workers that might be accessing through branch or retail locations or via work from home capabilities like mobile users. And it provides the transport to all the resources that these users would, would be accessing for their daily functionality. So it's gonna provide access to different SaaS-based applications. It's gonna provide access to any of the cloud-based resources which all of your employees use on a daily basis. It's gonna provide access to any of the privately hosted cloud or on-prem data center resources that your users are typically using for their day-to-day -day functionality and any internet-based resources as well. But it's not just providing access to the resource that sets the sassy based solution aside from your legacy VPN solution. It's the fact that it's also able to provide inline network services and security services. So you guys heard me say SASE, which is a buzzword in the IT industry right now. So I think it's important to highlight some of these services that Palo Alto actually offers through the Prisma Access solution. So there's a variety of networking services. It has the ability to provide SD-WAN functionality, to stitch together some of your branch locations to your, your main, uh, your corporate campus. It has the ability to provide secure transport in the way of VPN solutions like an IPsec tunnel or SSL tunnels. It also has the ability to do policy-based forwarding, which helps dictate if you have multiple data centers, which traffic is routed to which data center. But it doesn't just stop at network transport, it's also providing security services as well. And these are security services that have become synonymous with Palo Alto. So it has the ability to provide SSL decryption for all the traffic that's traversing the network. It's providing sandboxing functionality to help ensure that no malware is being transported across the network. It even has the ability to provide uh, zero trust capable policies to really enforce that, that role-based access despite where these users might be working from. And it even has the ability to implement um, the next generation firewall services as a service. So you don't have to deploy physical firewalls at any one of your branch locations. You have the ability to leverage these cloud gateways to enforce the same firewall rules that you'd be using at any of your previous locations. So I wanna take a, a couple minutes here just to kind of discuss all the components that make up Prisma Access. So for those of you who are familiar with Palo Alto products and our current customers, you're probably using Panorama to manage your entire solution. And going forward with Prisma Access, that's the same method of management for this solution. So it just ensures that you're gonna have to install a cloud-based plugin to manage your Prisma Access, but it gives you the ability to leverage all the rule sets that you've already created in your traditional next-gen firewalls all your decryption policies, all your networking policies, and all of your security policies that you've already created, you can leverage those same policies through Panorama and apply those to Prisma Access. For those of you who aren't current Palo Alto customers, what Panorama is, it's a centralized management solution. It provides the ability to provide software management, license management, networking and security management for your deployment. And that can be deployed as a physical fat form factor or a virtual form factor. All of the capabilities that Panorama is providing is it's going to be gleaning logging capabilities off of all your traffic. 
And all those logs, they don't necessarily need to be stored on your network. So Prisma offloads all of that logging capability into the Cortex data lake. The Cortex data lake is a data lake that's hosted inside of the cloud and it's providing central logging for all of your, your security services from Prisma Access. And it's able to provide analytics and telemetry off of the logs that are being offloaded into the Cortex data lake. Now, as all your end users are attempting to access the Prisma solution, they need to do so in a secure manner. And Prisma Access leverages the Global Protect client to provide that inline security for the users trying to access the network. The Global Protect client is essentially a VPN client that provides IPsec tunneling from the endpoints into Prisma Access. And the location that these endpoints are terminating at, they're terminating at security processing nodes, which are the gateways that provide ingress traffic into the Prisma Access solution. The gateways are gonna be your enforcement point, and they're also gonna be the place where all of the routing decisions are made for all the traffic that's entering the network, whether it's routing to the internet, to SaaS solutions, or if the traffic actually needs to be routed to the on-prem locations, all of those decisions are going to be made at the security processing nodes. And if traffic does need to be routed on-prem, that's what the service connection is for. The service connection is an IPsec tunnel that tunnels back into the on-prem data centers. The service connection is also what provides all of the access to applications and services which are running inside of organizations' environments. So that's the high-level overview of all the components that are included inside of the Prisma Access solution. But I want to take a minute to kind of review the high-level architecture of Prisma Access. So at its core, Prisma Access is a multi-tenant solution like you'll see with most SASE-based solutions. And I want to be transparent that Prisma Access does share a similar management plane across the cloud to do all of its cloud orchestration and operations. But the one thing that sets Prisma Access aside from a lot of our competitors is each individual tenant is going to have their own individual data plane. And what I mean by that is that all of the traffic that's traversing these security nodes, those nodes are nodes that are dedicated to each customer. And the real difference that that makes is you're not going to see one customer's bursting or scaling capabilities impact any of the other customer's instances. So as one customer might be scaling out to provide services for a growing user set, the fact that all of that data plane traffic is only going through their singular instance, they'll never have performance impact on any of the other customer's uh, instances that are running inside of the Prisma Access solution. And it also solves some issues that we've seen with similar SASE based technology that doesn't leverage um, a single tenant of the data plane. We've heard issues with users that have, are using the shared data plane model with some of our competitors that use shared IP space on egress. And the problems that that can create is if one of the, use, one of the other tenants that's sharing that IP space has an IP address that might get blacklisted, it also means that any other customer that might potentially use that IP address also gets blacklisted. So before we conclude, I just kind of want to highlight uh, the major benefits of implementing a solution like Prisma Access. So Prisma Access is a cloud native based architecture. What that means is it's going to be leveraging the backbone connections in the fiber network that GCP and AWS has already built out so you're getting quicker connections with less latency and using more direct routes to the resources that all of your users are going to be accessing. Uh, we also have commitments on scaling and performance capabilities for all of the security gateways that are gonna be stood up through the cloud providers. It offers streamlined deployments. So with a lot of, a lot of the SASE-based solutions, it requires network re-architecture with our solution, it does not. You simply just need a pipe to the internet and connect that directly to Prisma. And the fact that it's connected over the internet, like Dave highlighted earlier, we're able to spin these deployments up in 24 to 48 hours. So there's not a painful long onboarding steps needed to take to start to take advantage of Prisma access. 
because you're using uh, Palo Alto's proven next generation firewalls, you have all the inline analytics that you need to stop threats and provide all the monitoring that you need to ensure that the security posture of your environment is at the level it needs to be at. And again, because we're using cloud native architecture, we have the ability to dynamically scale out. You're not sharing data, data planes with any other locations, so you're not gonna have impacts from any other customers. Uh, the fact that we're using the cloud-based architecture, it allows us to scale out as needed without any manual intervention. This is all happening dynamically by using the elasticity of the cloud. And it doesn't require implementing and procuring more hardware at this point in time. So those are all the major, major benefits that you see by going with a, a solution like Prisma Access. And to put any of your compliance concerns at risk, I wanted to highlight all of the federal compliances that Prisma Access currently has. So Prisma Access is SOC 2 compliant. It is compliant with FIPS. And we're in the process of getting the uh, FedRAMP authorization. We have a commitment from our product team, which we've been using to distribute to any of our customers interested in procuring Prisma Access. And we have a number of customers that are using um, this commitment to take on and implement Prisma Access on their own right now. So with that being said, um, I'd like to open up the floor to answer any questions that might have come up throughout the presentation. Yeah, I've got, we've got uh, one question here we'll move to. And just to follow on to what Brian just said around uh, FedRAMP, uh, honestly, this is a time where, I mean, this is a rare time where we've seen customers be able to uh, move past. So just, just because we're in process, uh, typically some of our customers, including in the Department of Defense, who would normally require IL-4, IL-5 certifications, which no vendor has for a platform like this, no vendor has that, um, have been stepping out with us and, uh, and getting waivers because it's the right thing to do. Uh, the pieces and parts all have the security laid in. The, the issue is how long it takes for these things to go through the process to become IL, become FedRAMP high. Uh, so the one question here we've got uh, so far, Brian, um, how is this compliant with TIC? So most customers are still on TIC 2.2 uh, and TIC 3.0 is in process. This is something that we have focused on quite a bit. Um, so you wanna address that, Brian? Yeah, so as it relates to TIC, we do have the ability to provide um, policy-based forwarding. And the solution is really gonna fall in line with TIC 3.0. This is where we're gonna see the major benefits of being able to uh, implement our policy-based forwarding in the cloud to some of the enclaves that need to provide the TIC processing. Um, but it is able to provide the, like I said, the policy-based forwarding to help forward any of the TIC-specific traffic into the locations where it needs to be um, routed to on-prem. So I hope that answered the question. If, uh, if you had a follow on there, more than happy uh, if we didn't address something there. Any other questions from anybody else on the phone? Are there any plans to provide point solutions with the product? Uh, so if, as an example, uh, install this service in Mill Cloud. That's a good question. Uh, that I'm not quite sure. We would need to do a little bit more talk with some of our federal counterparts to figure out if that's something that they're willing to work with us on. So I, I'll answer it from a standpoint. Mill Cloud is a current customer of ours. Um, Mill Cloud being an example of basically a private cloud stood up for a, a defense instance uh, through our partner in GDIT. Um, this is something that they are evaluating. I know that there's a team uh, within our group who focuses on general dynamics and milk cloud specifically, one of Brian's peers, uh, and we are working with them. I think in general, you see the, the milk cloud example being more of a virtualized instance versus something that is this flexible. Um, and, but I would hope, I mean, this is probably the right way to do it uh, in, in the way of the future. And that's kind of honestly why it's so interesting this time that we're in because SASE is something that's relatively new. Uh, we're not the only vendor that, that, that offers a solution towards it, but it, the adoption rate of really moving an entire enterprise to SASE, especially in the federal government, has, has lagged. 
Uh, and there's reasons for that, one of them being FedRAMP and, and how long it takes to go through these things for innovative uh, uh, you know, solutions and for the procurement cycle. Uh, and so I, I believe this current crisis we're in offers actually a unique kind of opportunity to bypass some of that and, um, and to, to get it deployed and doing the same security. I mean, I think Brian covered it, but this is this, using the same tools, the same uh, security that we have embedded in on-prem solutions from Palo Alto Networks, which is being used all across the DOD intelligence community and federal government today. Uh, it's just when you package it up and offer it, you know, based on a cloud platform, even though the security controls are in place, it's that compliance process that takes the time. So, um, yeah, it, it's a good question. We can definitely follow up with you on MillCloud because we have solutions in play there. And this is a great example of MillCloud, you know, potentially uh, moving towards the future on something like this. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Uh, we have contact information that will be sent uh, as well. If you go one more slide there, Brian, we'll just pop up our information. Uh, and that's Wayne Lorech, who's his peer, who's presented on some of these. You are uh, welcome to reach out to either one of us, both of us, uh, and we'd love to you know, continue the dialogue. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, so first one, would we be able to get a demo to test the solution 100%? Uh, we have, if we want to do a demo and just, you know, we could do a demo with our team, demoing it for you, with you. Uh, if we wanted to do an eval license so that you could, you know, kick the tires on it yourself. Uh, we have all of those options available. So I'd love to follow up with uh, the listener there and we can, uh, we can 100% get uh, that demo working with you. Uh, the next question is, is it SaaS? Uh, so Brian. So there are two ways to consume it. For most of our federal customers, you're going to consume it not as a SaaS-based solution. The solution would be consumed um, by utilizing our on-prem appliance, which can either be physical or form, uh, physical or virtual form factor, which is Panorama. So it wouldn't be a SaaS-based solution. It would be a solution that's managed in the cloud, and you're providing all the management capabilities by using Panorama, which is part of the bundle. Uh, the trust model, which Dave was was talking about. Okay, we'll give it one more chance for any last questions. Uh, are there any basic checks performed on the client that connects, uh, Brian? So is there an antivirus program, um, basic basic uh, checking or is it a sandbox? Uh, I'll let you answer that, but I think it, it has both, correct? Yeah, yeah, so the client actually, the, the checks are not performed by the client itself, um, but the checks are performed by the security gateways. So the security gateways have the ability to provide host information process checks, which essentially has the ability that most VPN clients would be able to do to look at operating system, is antivirus installed? Um, is there any encryption going on the disk? Uh, what level of patching is on the operating system? All the standard host checks you'd see, um, our software has the ability to do all of those host checks as well. You know, honestly, Brian, if you scroll up to uh, slide 10, I believe that's where um, the best slide that kind of covers what we're talking about. Is this slide? Uh, uh, down, okay. down a little right bit, there. yep, right there. Yeah. So. The global protect client would be the one scanning the actual endpoint, um, which is the client software that would be installed on the different laptops or mobile devices. But it's going to get all the policies that it needs to scan against from this, uh, this security as a service layer. So all of those security gateways are going to be instructing those clients before they connect uh, to scan the host to find out what level of patching it has, um, what type of antivirus it's running, what level of disk encryption, and it's able to do it vendor by vendor, right? So if you guys are actually using um, Palo Alto's product Traps to do your, your antivirus, it can validate the Traps is installed and they're not using another vendor's product. So you can make sure that those policies are specific to your agency. And that would integrate with third-party tools out there as well, correct? So if it was, if they're using a different endpoint, it, it could integrate with that. Exactly, and all of all of the uh, the vendors that we we comply with. So all the vendors, which it's a huge list, way too long to go into here. 
um, it's listed on all of our documents. So if you had specific vendors that you're curious about, um, if you forwarded those questions along with Wayne or myself, we could go ahead and just validate for you that the software that you're using or the processes that you're running are software processes that we can run checks for through our HIP profiles. And it, just as an example, in the federal government that we're specifically talking about today, that list includes folks like McAfee or Symantec, you know, uh, you know, the standard players that you see out there. Okay, well, I'll ask one more time because the other times I asked, uh, we got a couple of good questions there. Uh, any final questions? Right. Well, thanks again uh, for joining us. Uh, again, what we're trying to do is to make this simple for our customers. Uh, none of these solutions are simple on the back end, obviously. Um, they're simple for folks like Brian or, or Wayne to address and maybe some of the folks on the phone, not, not to a layman like myself. Uh, but what is simple is how to budget for this, how to procure this. Uh, that's what we've tried to take the complexity out of. Um, so, And we will take on that complicated process in the background to make sure that what gets installed and what get licensed uh, is what that customer requires. Uh, and we'd love to, to explore that with you, whether it's in a demo uh, or an eval environment, proof of concept, or if folks are uh, in a bind and need to move forward. We've seen that too, honestly. I mean, it's, it's a rare time in my career. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this where folks are just saying, I need something right now. I need it in 24 hours because I got people that are out there working off their home laptops or, whatever, and either can't do their job uh, and support the mission or are doing it in roundabout ways with very little security. So look forward to working with everybody on the phone and uh, folks that may be listening to the recording to help solve some of these challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, David and Brian.